I suppose I should put in a disclaimer that I'm not actually an archaeologist. I'm just trying my best here, trying to be interdisciplinary. And I realise there's too many people for handouts, so you get extra bird pictures. Um, all right. So, in my PhD research, I'm applying the theoretical framework of human-animal studies to um, the interdisciplinary study of human-bird interactions and bird symbolism in Viking Age and medieval Scandinavia and sort of Norse culture more broadly, meaning the, the peoples of Northern Europe who spoke Norse languages from around the 8th to the 15th centuries. Um, Human-animal studies is relatively new as a theoretical entity and in short it aims to investigate the whys, hows and whats of human-animal relations. Um, and what this means for me is that as well as looking at artistic and literary representations of animals, particularly birds, and interpreting them with a purely human belief system behind them, I try to see if I try to use um, ethological reports to see if there's any animal behavior behind this symbolism and also to try and see if these beliefs and representations held any effects for the animals that lived alongside the humans that produced these representations. Um, and yeah, so um, the idea, while human animal studies, again, newish, the idea that we should pay attention to hum um, animal representations in Old Norse literature and myth is hardly new at all. Um, and uh, Roberta Frank has commented, well, quite scathingly on the idea that people should bring in bird behavior and bird with little random bird factoids into uh, Norse literature stating that it is never the bird that gives the thought it's the thought that produces the bird however this attitude has changed in uh, in recent years with um, Alexander Puskovsky and Eric Lacey demonstrating in their work that um, early medieval representations of animals are very closely connected with uh, the behavior of animals and the natural world as it is observed by people. And um, Burr Jensen dis has described how these beliefs could in turn influence how people treated animals. So the example that Jensen uses is um, uh, sort of <coughs> sentient mythological wolves in Norse myth, me yeah, obviously, um, have um, may have caused people in Viking Age Dublin to perhaps overreact to dogs' behave misbehavior because they were attributing something approximating human minds and intentions to these dogs. Um, for the purposes of simplicity and bre brevity and interestingness, uh, this presentation will focus on two types of bird. These are eagles and ravens. These are the most prominent in Old Norse literature, and I'm trying to put together the literary and zooarchaeological sources together to see if there are any connections between the representations of these birds and the, how these birds lived alongside Norse peoples during this rather long early modern period, uh, early medieval period. Um, so, and yeah, as far as my research has taken me so far, um, the sources seem to show that while the relationship between birds and bird symbolism was far from simple, it would be a misrepresentation to say that the thoughts invariably preceded the bird. Um, so, there is literary stuff coming up, but I'll try and keep it brief. Um, in the medieval literature of Iceland, um, 
which is where we get the majority of our informa information that's used to reconstruct um, the beliefs and practices of pre-Christian Norse peoples, ravens and eagles are very strongly associated with the god Odin. In Grimnismal, uh, Grimnir, who, spoiler alert, is Odin, um, says each day Hugin and Munin, uh, who are Odin's ravens, um, fly out over the world. I fear that Hugin may not come back, but I worry more about Munin. Uh, Sn Snorri Sturluson in the early 13th century expanded upon this in Gilvaginning, uh, saying that two ravens sit on Odin's shoulders and speak news of all things they see or hear into his ears. He sends them out at dawn to fly all around the world, and they come back at breakfast, which I think is adorable. Um, from this, he becomes knowledgeable of all events. Therefore, people call him the Raven's God. Um, so, so far from these two texts, it, yeah, it appears that birds, these birds played a role as the informers of Odin. Eagles, too, um, are associated with Odin. Again, if we go to Gil Beginning, or depending on which edition you're using, Skull Scuffer Mole, um, it is said that Odin, in this time pretending to be Bölverker, um, stole the mead of poetry and then he changed into his eagle skin, Artnaham, and flew as quickly as he could to escape before he, before he was chased out or, and caught, but didn't quite, almost didn't work. Uh, he lost the, the worst bit of poetry. Um, and... However, um, it's not just Odin who can, who is associated with eagles. Um, these, these sort of primal, powerful beings called the Yetnard, who are called giants but aren't really giants at this point yet, um, can also turn into eagles. And these Yetnard include um, Tjatsi, Sutungur, and Reisvelgur, whose name means carrion swallower, which this will become more important in a bit. Um, while some, some people are quite happy to accept that uh, ravens and eagles are sort of the animal attributes of Odin, um, others argue that the connections between Odin and these birds are predicated on the fact that um, both are independently connected to death. The argument runs that eagles and ravens are known scavengers and it's not a great stretch to imagine that when a battle took place, all these sort of scavenging birds took a, peeped in and went, oh, look, nice load of food. Um, and this is also attested in skaldic poetry, where eagles and ravens turn up at the end of battles and warriors are referred to as the feeders of the eagles and the ravens, if they're particularly good at what they do. Um, and this also has parallels in the Old English Beasts of Battle topos, which is where a raven, a wolf, and an eagle all turn up, usually before a battle, to signal that someone's not going to come out of this particularly happy. Um, now, Odin is said to have collected the spirits of the slain in, who died in battle, and for his own purposes in creating a sort of army of the dead um, to, for, to help him in Ragnarok and over time it's possible that Odin and these birds of battle may have become associated um, because they sort of both harvested the dead for their own ends I suppose and over time this, co this connecting factor became lost and these birds became Odin's attribute. Um, Connections between eagles and Jötnar are a little more complicated, but also so quite straightforward, really. Um, eagles are big. Um, the white-tailed sea eagle can reach a length of 90 centimetres and a wingspan of 240 centimetres. And it's not a stretch to see how this could become associated with these sort of very powerful primal beings 
And eagles were also used in Roman iconography. And when it was the, and the Germanic tribes of, say, the migration period were paid in Roman coins, um, some of which had, might have had little eagles, or they might have seen eagle iconography while they were mercenaries. And they sort of adopted it themselves as a symbol of military power and material wealth. And over time, this became myth mythologized in the form of the Jötnard. So while it's perhaps a, there's more at play here, um, there is this idea that just the simple power of these animals coupled with its um, cross, this sort of cross-cultural transmission of iconography um, worked together to create, associate the eagles and the Jötnard. There's also some uh, more idiosyncratic bits of Norse raven lore that human animal studies can help explain. Um, so not only do ravens go to battlefields, they're said to follow warriors. This appears in a number of texts. We have the 10th century skaldic poem Haraldskvæði, where a raven says, we have followed Haraldur, the son of Halfdan, the young nobleman, since we hatched from the egg. Um, it also appears in the uh, Eddic poem Regin's Maul, where it is said that the dark raven is a faithful companion for the sword tree, meaning a man, and it's a good omen to see one before you go into battle. And this also appears in prose texts, such as the such as Njald Saga, set in sort of 10th, 11th century Iceland, when Skarthjæðin, who's the hot-headed son of the title character, um, goes to confront someone, and the narrative states that two ravens flew with him and his uh, followers the whole way. And, spoiler alert, he does quite well out of this. Um, and although this could be indicating Odin's favour, there is another possible explanation behind this. Um, modern research into raven behaviour hasn't really found ravens following soldiers, but they do follow wolves and large birds of prey because these animals are more ab able to bring down large prey and open carcasses that ravens can't access with their beaks and claws. Also, ravens in North America are seen following um, people who hunt elk, based, seemingly based on their clothes, the way they're behaving, the objects they're carrying. And these birds have learned to follow people who act and look a certain way, and they will get food out of it. So we can sort of extrapolate as to how this bit of uh, folklore might have had real-world roots. Um, so yeah, but what about, did this, any of this mean anything for the ravens and the eagles themselves? Um, if these animals were symbolically powerful within Old Norse culture, did this symbolic potency affect the ways in which humans treated the ravens and eagles that they encountered? Um, so in order to address this, I tried to uh, investigate zooarchaeological reports um, on bird bones found in uh, sort of Viking Age and early medieval <coughs> settlement sites. Um, in this presentation, uh, I'll be focusing on this collection of sources, which includes Koigru at Orkney, Ekatorp in Sweden, Skuggi in Iceland, um, Spekakot in Iceland, and a group of Danish sites that were all um, discussed by Anne-Brigitte Gottfridsen, I hope I'm pr pronouncing that right, um, in her discussion of bird bones in Viking Age Danish culture. Um, the most common, the common sort of eagles and ravens in, and sort of the most likely candidates for Urn and Hratten are the white-tailed sea eagle and the common raven. And these appear throughout Northern Europe. Uh, unfortunately, the white-tailed sea eagle has been hunted almost to extinction in certain parts since the medieval period, but, um, but it was quite abundant at the time. Um, they're not common in the archaeological record, but also they 
do appear quite regularly throughout settlement sites, and it would appear, and also there are juvenile skeletons that have been found, particularly in Ekitorp, which suggest that there were stable breeding communities of these birds near human settlements, presumably treating these settlements as a sustainable source of food throughout the year. Um, not too different from today's urban birds, such as the seagulls and crows that you might see in cities in the UK. Um, now, as far as the common raven is concerned, there's very minimal evidence that there was any kind of human-raven interaction on a sort of a regular basis. Their skeletons are found quite regularly, but um, they usually are also quite unmarked. So they weren't captured, they weren't hunted, they weren't sacrificed. Um, and this is the same across pre- and post-Christianization sites. I'm, here I'm sort of using the 10th century as a very oversimplified cutoff point for sort of when were things Christianized. Um, and so, yeah, there's very little difference to be found here. The um, archaeologists at the Koigru site commented on this in their report, um, sort of saying that, the yeah, these bird ravens are absent from the earliest phase when pagan practices were expected. So instead, these animals were killed due to their predatory or scavenging activities and seen as pests. Um, so, yes, uh, however important they were in mythological texts, they did not have any sort of material ritual significance that can be found in the record, these records. And perhaps the only ex exception to this is the farm at Skuggi. This was a sort of 11th, 12th century site, seasonally occupied, and it has a very high yield of raven bones. And several of the long bones, so like wings, um, have breaks and cut marks, which do indicate that these birds were butchered and consumed. Um, which is interesting, because the medieval law codes, like Graugaus and Jonsbok, explicitly forbid the consumption of ravens and many other birds, which is a law that seems to be based on the dietary uh, taboos in Leviticus. Um, it also says in Leviticus you shouldn't really eat waterfowl, but um, I think that the Norse people were being a bit pragmatic here and decided that they were too good as a food source to <laughs> give up. Um, but Ravens aren't really that great as a food source. Um, so what was happening? Um, so Ramona Harrison and um, the others who were working on this uh, site in their report also note that there is a very distinctive lack of ptarmigan bones and freshwater fish bones. And these animals were the ver very key sources of food for more inland Icelandic um, settlements in the medieval period. Um, and most inland Icelandic excavations do have a lot of ptarmigan bones that indicate that these birds were consumed. Um, and they then sort of go a bit further with this and suggest that because it was a seasonally occupied site um, occupied by tenant farmers, um, the hunting rights for these nicer food sources were reserved to the landowners and in out of sheer desperation, these tenant farmers instead had to hunt and eat ravens. Um, and it, but this is only one site, and in all of my research so far, the only other um, mention of raven consumption that I've found comes from a 17th century appendix to a copy of Landnámabók, which is a sort of chronicle of the settlement of Iceland in which uh, they say that there was a famine in the late 10th century and Icelanders ate ravens and killed the elderly to sort of stay alive. But this is late, unique and probably exaggerated. Probably exaggerated. So um, it's hard to tell how accurate this might have been. Overall, while ravens didn't really benefit from their mythological significance, 
They also didn't suffer any ritual killing or capture. They were basically ignored unless they sort of got a little too close in their scavenging activities and humans thought they might start preying on the livestock. And in most cases, white-tailed sea eagles appear to have a similar relationship with humans in medi early medieval Norse culture. Unless they were causing a threat to livestock, there's little to say that they had much to do with humans. Apart from one particular practical purpose, which marks eagles as distinct from ravens. Um, again, uh, going back to Gottfredson's analysis of... Um, Viking Age Danish settlement sites, she notes that there's a disproportionate amount of bone, eagle bones at these sites, um, with some of which had marks or, that suggest these birds were kept in prolonged captivity. And these patterns have also been observed in the medieval finds from Ekator. And in both cases, there's a lot of wing bones, a lot of sort of bits to do with tails, and it's sort of been suggested in both reports that these birds were caught and their feathers were harvested, possibly for arrow fletching. And in some cases, it, they would be kept in long-term captivity and harvested repeatedly as their feathers grew back. Um, there is a small chance these might have been kept as high-status pets, but it's very unlikely that someone would sort of go, behold, my balding eagle, isn't it wonderful? Um, so it's sort of, hard to see if there might have been some kind of prestige in fletching your arrows with eagle feathers. There might have been, and it might have been because they're big and scary, or it might have been because they were sort of associated with gods and yetna. It's, um, but it's a bit speculative at this stage, and it's probably going to remain that way unless I find something really exciting. Um, so while these birds had marginally more interaction with humans than ravens did, um, their mythological and symbolic significance had very little identifiable role in the way they were treated. So to conclude, um, an analysis of the remains of eagles and ravens from these Viking Age and medieval Scandinavian sites, in tandem with their portrayals in literature, lead to interesting but very unromantic conclusions. Um, the Norse literary and artistic uh, representations of eagles and ravens show that people were very aware of these birds and they displayed an active interest in observing and interpreting their behaviour in ways that were potentially connected to religious <coughs> beliefs. However, this interest was always invariably subordinate to practical matters. These birds fired the imagination and there was no thought without the bird to prompt it. Yet, at no point, pre- or post-Christianization, is there evidence to suggest that either bird was venerated by the Old Norse peoples. Um, much like today, as soon as these birds strayed within humans' physical, rather than imaginative reach, the most likely result was death or exploitation in the name of human gain. Thank you for listening.